I would like to acknowledge the elders past and present on the traditional lands that we're meeting on tonight, the Wajak Noongar people. My name is Susan McEwen and I'm the Director of Library Services here at the State Library and I'm very pleased to welcome everyone here tonight for our first referendum panel conversations, Voices. The very first priority in our strategic plan at the State Library is to reflect the rich diversity of our community and how we collect, preserve and share our unique Western Australian stories. Through our exhibitions, events and partnerships, we are proud to provide a platform for discussion, ideas and to hear a diverse range of Western Australian voices. Tonight's event is an extension of that goal. Thank you to our panellists um, for contributing to tonight's discussion and thank you to you, the audience, for being important voices in this dialogue. It is important to us tonight that tonight's conversation is respectful. If you would like to ask a question at the end of this panel, please do keep your questions concise and in the spirit of open conversation and perspective sharing. Tonight's conversation will discuss the background to the Voice to Parliament, including its origins and discussion around differing views on the proposed constitutional amendments. We will also look at the upcoming vote from an international perspective. A reminder that there will be a second event held in this theatre on the 4th of October, which will focus on the perspectives of elders and youth leaders in Western Australia. I will now hand over to our moderator, Victoria Laurie. Hi everyone, my name's Victoria Laurie and I too would like to acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Wajak Noongar people. And I'd like to welcome you all very warmly to this discussion about why your voice matters in the forthcoming voice referendum, which as we have been told is on October the 14th. Whatever your opinion, we respect your interest in this topic and the fact that you have taken time in your busy lives to come and listen, so thank you. And there will be time for questions afterwards. We have a really wonderful panel um, in no particular order, but I'll start with the Honourable Ken Wyatt, former Liberal Federal Minister for Indigenous Australians, the first Indigenous Australian elected to the House of Representatives, the first to serve as a government minister, the first appointed to cabinet. Ken must have more frequent flyer points than anybody I know after all his trips to uh, Canberra. We have Dr. Hannah McGlade, a respected academic and expert on Indigenous human rights law, who was appointed to the UN Permanent Forum for Indigenous Issues in 2020. We have Jackie Oakley to my right, former chair of Derbal Yerrigan Health Service, but also a senior policy contributor at both state and federal levels, and now founder of Nanus for Kids. And there are nine grandchildren, I think, so you're well qualified on that score. And Shanali Pereira, a Sri Lankan-born community arts expert who is really in tune with the thinking of a really diverse uh, range of groups, migrant groups and other groups, young and old, um, and she works with them on community projects. And I think you're a boxer too. I'm That's trying to... <laughs> <laughs> Probably won't come into the conversation tonight, but <laughs> congratulations. <coughs> the other day, I was speaking with a fellow journalist, Naomi Moran, who is an indigenous editor of the Koori Mail, which is the indigenous national newspaper. And she had just issued a voice edition of her newspaper with the front page dedicated to Indigenous leaders' views on both the yes and on the no side. Because of course there are different views within Indigenous community, just as there are in Australia's broader population. But what really struck me about our conversation was one comment Naomi made and it was not about whether she thinks we should vote yes or no. Naomi said to me that she feels strongly about looking beyond the vote, however it lands. She said, we need to ask what we were all doing outside this conversation to change attitudes. So I'd love us all to approach tonight's conversation in that spirit. 
We're here because we all care about the issues that this referendum raises. And this conversation might clarify the next steps we should all take as a nation, regardless of how we vote and what the referendum decides. Let's not forget that it was Liberal Prime Minister John Howard who, in October 2007, promised to hold a referendum on recognition of Indigenous people in our Constitution. And it was then Labour leader Kevin Rudd who gave bipartisan support. So the idea of including First Nations people in Australia's founding document, recognising heritage and ancient and ongoing connection to the Australian continent, has been around for a long time. And that's the first part of what you'll be asked to vote on. The second part is more vexed. Should Indigenous people be given a permanent voice to advise government on matters that affect them? It's reasonable that people are asking what impact it would have on the rest of the Australian population and on our lawmaking. Now, I'm going to first ask each of our panellists to imagine they're in a lift and the door closes and someone turns to them and says, what do you think this referendum is all about? And how do you feel about it? And our panellists have got less than two minutes before the lift door opens again. <laughs> so I'll start, if I may, with, um, with Jackie. Okay. Uh, what does it mean? Yes, to you. To me. And what do you think it's all about? I think it's about time actually, in terms of... <laughs> uh, when you think about the history of this country, you have 1788, then you have 1967, nearly 200 years later, they decide to recognise us as people in this country, even though we were here first 60,000 years ago. So, and then after the 67 referendum, which gave the government the powers to make laws and decisions about Aboriginal people, um, they have done that in various ways, but not always in the best interest of Aboriginal people, and certainly not with um, being guided by us in a really constructive and sustainable way that is to the benefit of our community. So uh, the next stage, I think, and I believe, is to actually give voice to the person that they recognised in 1967. Now, it was the goodwill of the Australian people that decided to rec us, recognise us in 1967, and I'm hoping that the descendants, and there wouldn't be that many around now, of the 90% that voted in 1967, will continue that goodwill and take it to the next level in terms of the advancement of my people, but also the advancement of this country into a positive era and reflect us as a country that has grown and matured into the first world country that we have the potential to be in terms of how we treat our First Nations people. Thank you, Jackie. And we'll be coming back to more, more of your, your thoughts, but I just want to get a bit of a snapshot. So th that's lovely. Thank you. And Ken. I see what it means to me is Given my career as a public servant in health, education, heading up the Lands Trust, and then ultimately as a member of parliament, visiting just about every Aboriginal community across this nation, and looking at what should change, I'm just all blown away by the fact that there are communities where they drink water with uranium salts in, nitrates in the water. Ever go to a community and climb up on the tank and have a look inside, it's a beautiful iridescent green algae that floats in the tank of the water that people drink. But then access to services and giving people the opportunity of when they raise an issue with government agencies 
that they respond. I went to a community where the water was a milky white. The community had been drinking that, but they had raised with Commonwealth and state agencies their dilemma of water that was really unpalatable, but that's all they had. I went out there, spent two hours in that community talking about just that issue. A week later, we had clear water for them. We negotiated with the pastorist next door to allow us to put a bore into his aquifer. That community had been asking for some eight years. And what I'd want to see at the end of all of this, regardless of the outcome, is it's forced public servants and members of all parliaments, including local governments, to listen, to act, and to have Indigenous Australians sit at the table and jointly negotiate and jointly reach solutions that have intangible, of very tangible outcomes on their lives. I'd hate to think what my body would be like if I drank uranium salt water, probably needing dialysis after 10, 15 years. That's what I want to see. Thank you. Um, Hannah. Two minutes. From Adelaide, and I had the great fortune to listen to Prime Minister Anthony Albanese announce Referendum Day, 14th of October. And his speech, I just felt, was so powerful. I really, um, I think it really sums up why I uh, believe in the voice and think it's so critical. This is really about uh, becoming a better country. This is about overcoming dis uh, disadvantage in Australia. Uh, this is about our future. And we all know that we have come from a past where Aboriginal people were very cruelly dispossessed, including by the legal system. And it was once declared that this country was terra nullius. And our, our High Court has rejected that and said it was a shameful aspect of our nation. But we've still got this work to do. And you know that's, that's really why I think it's so critical. I think it's really calling on Australia to reach that higher, better self, which we know has been a part of many of our histories, but we need this reform um, to really make the difference in terms of um, you know, the, the failures of government policies to listen, to hear, to do better. The fact is so many people of our, of our people are still suffering and we have this right, we have this right to have a place in the national constitution in this very special form of a representative body and voice. Shinali, what do you think this, as a young Australian, what do you think this referendum is all about and how do you feel about it? Well, to me, the word that immediately comes to mind is invitation. To me, it's an invitation to participate. I've never been part of a referendum uh, vote before and it's an invitation to not just participate but to be an active participant in our democracy in learning about how Australia's governance works. And also, um, I was imagining this person in the lift with me, I would actually ask back to them, have you read or listened to the Uluru Statement from the Heart? And say they didn't speak English or say it wasn't their first language. There's actually some 70 translations that SBS have done of the Uluru Statement. And it is the most beautiful poetic invitation that I have ever heard in the context of a political, you know, legal, you read legal documents, you read political declarations, and this is probably one of the most beautiful invitations, and yet it is strong and it has clarity. So, yeah, I would ask them if they've listened to it and heard it and what they think. Thank you. Ken, uh, I mean, as we know, we're, we're holding our 45th referendum in our history, and it's the first in this century. So really historic stuff and thought-provoking debate going on. But I think hanging over the referendum debate is the notion that some feel that it would give Aboriginal people, and I've heard the phrase, an unfair slice of the pie, a disproportionate say by a minority in all aspects of government decision-making. What is your response to to that concern? Actually, I find that concern extremely interesting in that when you look at what the voice is and you look at the chapter that will be inserted into the Constitution, there are two elements. One is 
the principal one is recognising, then there is a second component. But the third one that's important that people are not even considering is that the parliament shall determine the structure, the functions and the other elements to do with the voice. The voice is just a committee. No committee in Australia has had an inordinate influence on any government. Powerful individuals have, because of the virtue of industries they belong to, they can influence government decisions. I've been there, been involved in that process. But this one is fundamentally Aboriginal people saying, we want about to talk to government. We want to set directions and priorities that are not set by government agencies, in which we can determine the future and ultimately the future for our grandchildren, not just today's generation, but for the future that gives them a better outcome. And so I'm disappointed with my former colleagues who are saying this is giving an inordinate authority to Indigenous Australians when it doesn't do that at all. What it does is it guarantees this committee will remain as a focus for all governments to consult with. And that's all it does, because Commonwealth governments, both Labor and Liberal, have abolished many Aboriginal advisory bodies when they don't like the advice that they have been given. And I was on the National Aboriginal Education Committee. John Dawkins didn't like our advice, called us in and abolished the committee. But I said to somebody last night at a forum, think about the legacy of the NAEC. Every university has an Aboriginal support program in it that enables Indigenous students to progress into various disciplines. It impacted on schools, it impacted on learning pathways in secondary education, particularly boarding for remote students. So that's all it is. It's nothing more than that. Hannah, let, let's tackle this one because, uh, you know, you, you, you have, um you know, an understanding of how other cu countries have, tickle, have tackled the issues of reconciling with First Nations people. You understand um, what treaties are, etc. And, I mean, tackling this, this question about whether the voice will delay, and the voice being, of course, a, a committee of individuals, that they would delay executive action by use of its rights to be heard and they'd litigate and that every executive body of government will then have to negotiate with the voice body on everything it plans to do. We've heard this discussion um, and this concern that's been raised, so I'd like you to respond to that. Well, the best people who have responded to that are our constitutional lawyers, our leading professors such as Anne Twomey and others, Gabrielle Appleby and, um, and many, and they've all explained that there is no uh, real risk of litigation involved with the voice because it is an advisory body. It cannot um, be an arm of government that holds government um, you know, down in any way at all. So I think the constitutional law experts have made it very clear and you know the, the peak law bodies, the Law Society of Australia, the law uh, um, national bodies are, are very supportive of this because they don't see uh, any legal risks and they know that uh, this um, uh, past um, uh, way that Aboriginal people have been made invisible really uh, is, is not, not acceptable. We, we have lagged behind other common law countries around the world who had treaties and other agreements. Uh, those, those relationships, those treaties are. Can you give us a couple of instances of where perhaps Australia differs from those other well, countries? Well, we know, of course, in, in New Zealand, not very far, there was the Treaty of Waitangi. And today the Waitangi Tribunal uh, plays an important role in regards to any uh, breaches or questions about uh, the treaty. So there is a constant... Um, a constant dialogue happening between the state and Indigenous peoples uh, via their uh, tribal authorities and councils and in regards to their treaty rights. It's, it's not all rosy, but this is um, a part of their constitutional framework 
and it takes different forms in other countries. We know in the United States, indigenous tribes who had treaties, which was generally often the case, are considered domestic sovereign nations. And so they have their own police forces and their own indigenous courts in many, um, in many tribes in the States. In Canada, it's different again, and they've also had modern day treaty making. I'm quite interested in the Nordic countries and hope to travel soon to uh, study the Sami parliaments. And I've had a little bit of um, learning from those bodies um, in my role with the Permanent Forum. And they've been around a, a quite, a, quite a while and uh, they're a, um, a respected part of the, the political framework. They're not constitutionally protected, they're, they're our, um, legislated bodies, but they have some, some rights to be consulted. So just very quickly to go back to our, our nearest neighbour, New Zealand, how does what is proposed here in the way of a voice uh, and, and uh, one that, of course, the parliament will eventu would eventually decide what it comprises of and it, its powers uh, to some extent. How does that equate with what is in New Zealand? How, what works well, in New this Zealand? This is a very unique proposal. So we, we don't think there is another constitutional provision in the world that actually uh, gives Aboriginal people this protected right to a voice, a democratically elected representative body. In New Zealand, they have um, Māori seats in parliament. Uh, and I think they're from the Māori Party. Ken will probably know more about that. Uh, but they have a national iwi council of their tribes and, uh, um, and they have the Waitangi Tribunal as a strong tribunal to adjudicate treaty claims um, to this day. They've had significant treaty claims. Jackie, when, um, I mean, you've worked in um, peak bodies, you know, at, at all levels um, and you've, you've been invited to you know, offer opinion to, to shape policy. Um, do, you, do you really think that a voice, a group of Aboriginal representatives advising our federal government can improve, uh, improve the conditions for, for Indigenous people? And I'm thinking particularly of the closing the gap measures, you know, the, the high suicide rates, the uh, 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 longevity um, and the gap in there. I'm just wondering how you can explain again to the person in the lift how you think personally the voice would affect or promote better policy. Um, well over history we've had different arrangements where um, bodies have been set up like the National Aboriginal Conference and the um, the last one was the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, ATSIC. Now I worked as a senior policy officer of the national office um, in terms of uh, the rights section of ATSIC. And I know from working in ATSIC, and I was also the deputy state manager and also the regional manager in Kalgoorlie. So I've worked at all levels of ATSIC and I know that the voice of Aboriginal people coming from the community base was instrumental in terms of how ATSIC went about its business. So in terms of guiding the um, gu um, process of ATSIC, of where to allocate money and what issues to respond to, it was very empowering in terms of the community. Now, in terms of uh, the delegations of ATSIC, um, the Board of Commissioners, which was the official commission, um, they came up through the community process and uh, they took their advice at all levels of the process. And then the, when Aboriginal people something else was happening in other departments, ATSIC could go through portfolio commissioners and have an intervention on behalf of the communities or talk to policy officers or advise, direct the policy officers within ATSIC to go and have an intervention. So in effect, we had a voice, but it, because it was legislated, 
And then it was about the same time all the reconciliation stuff was happening and it was coming to an end and people were challenging John Howard to take that next step after the reconciliation process had been completed. And they put things on the table that should happen following reconciliation. Um, and they had a delegation for that. But it never eventuated. He took <laughs> humbridge, I suppose, at these people in terms of what they put on the table. Um, and within a week or two, in the middle of the night on Friday, I think it was, ATSIC was closed down. And I went to work on Monday morning and was told there was no more ATSIC. It's gone. And, and uh, I mean, uh, Ken, your, your former colleagues, uh, and specifically uh, Mr Dutton, says that in fact legislation is the way to go. And that uh, I noticed the other day he was talking about the importance of having some control and some power in which you can dial up, this is his words, dial up or dial down the, uh, the power of, of, a, um, of a group such as The Voice. I, I wonder what your response is, is to that. Actually, you never dial up, you never dial down. Um, I, I think of every committee that exists that lobby within parliaments. And the Religious Discrimination Bill uh, was a bill that was brought forward. It wasn't supported in the party room. It was taken back out. It wasn't supported by a section of, uh, a, of a particular religious faith. That took a long time. Now, they tried to dial down opposition to the, racial uh, the religious discrimination bill. But that didn't happen because people have a passion for what they believe in. And any committee, if it is an issue of significance, will fight it with a passion to effect change. It, it's always interesting when you can say uh, something like that because that's not the reality. Uh, and um, it, it's a pity that he's using language like that um, because it's just dis distracting from Australia making a decision to just let Aboriginal people have a national committee that's guaranteed to always be there and not on a Friday night have their offices locked, uh, but have the continuity. And in, in hindsight, when I look at the Mabo decision reaction, I was with the state premier whose immediate reaction on hearing the Mabo decision said, there goes our backyards. There goes our properties. That's not happened. Mabo has not had the impact that every state premier, including the coalition government, John Howard and others, said would happen. We still have economic development. We still have progress. So this dialing up, dialing down uh, really is a furphy to try and convince people that, yeah, we'll do it on our terms. I just want to pick up on your point, uh, Jackie, about how things might work. I want to linger on how things might work and what happens when policy makers listen to Aboriginal people. Um, and I'm thinking of the pandemic and I remember how brilliantly the Aboriginal medical services handled the very real danger to vulnerable communities like Balgo and, uh, you know, all over um, interior of, of WA. And as far as I could tell, mainstream health services actually listened and gave agency to, you know, the Broome Medical Service, etc. And we had this remarkable outcome. But w would I be right in thinking that this is an example of a good example, an example where listening worked? Um, uh, you know, I, d I don't know. Definitely, and um, you know. Earlier on in the century, we had what was the influenza um, epidemic that went through and killed so many of our people and uh, no assistance whatsoever from the government. And then you contrast that with the COVID, the community themselves before government even um, responded, responded themselves, started locking down their own communities and locking people out and whatever. Hey. Pardon me, the government could not have had the resources to service Aboriginal people at that time and servicing 
the mainstream in the big cities. So they had to uh, engage with the um, decision makers and work collaboratively with the local community to ensure that, um, I think they did it under the Biodiversity Act or something, Biosecurity Act, where they are obligated to do things. But by Im they didn't empower the community, the com community took the power and the responsibility themselves, decided what capacity they had as a community to deal with the epidemic and then identified the extra resources that government would have to inject into their communities to ensure that no deaths occurred. And this is all, you know, the majority unskilled people who just had a general knowledge of how their community would take to any advice, any instruction, any direction and respond to keep them all safe. So uh, it was a good lesson for government to see that we could take control of our own crises and fix it to the benefit of our community, but they never then took that learning into other areas once the epidemic was over, which is quite sad because the community are quite proud of the way they all, in the most isolated areas, with no resources or whatever, saved their communities. It was a massive feat for Aboriginal people and has not been given the credit that it should have been given in terms of the responses of government. I want to ask, I'm, I'm going to come to, to you, Shanali, in a minute, because I, I, I actually want to know what the people you mix with um, on a, a daily basis, people from all walks of life who probably do, in some cases, sort of say, look, I'm, I have no idea what this is about and, and I do want more detail. I'll come back to you in a second, but I just want to finish this bit of the conversation because um, I had somebody quite uh, a very prominent Indigenous uh, person, elder, the other day talking to me about their concern about the actual c formation of the voice. You know, there, would, there are 14, for example, this person said, for example, there are 14 Noongar nations and you would need not just 14 people, but you would need 28 from the Noongar nations alone because you need male and female. In other words, they were suggesting, uh, not that they were opposed, but that they just found the whole notion cumbersome and, and, and worrying. And I, perhaps, uh, Hannah and Ken, perhaps if you could respond to that. Victoria has a, a Koori assembly that's been up and running for well over a year. And, and I would like to think that we in this state could do similar uh, we have an Aboriginal committee that is appointed by the government, but that's not an appointment of our people. We need to be uh, uh, respected to have that democratic right to vote our, our leaders into uh, positions similar to the Victoria Assembly, uh, who would then, um, as a state assembly taking in um, all, all, um, all of West Australia, complement, there would be another arrangement, I think, um, to the national um, the national body, the national voice. But we haven't worked out the details of the voice. There has been proposals with um, Ken's work that he can speak of, but uh, it's, um, it's really about the head of power and the principles being accepted. And the government has been very clear about the principles that people will be democratically elected, that there will be gender equality, that youth will have a voice, as will elders, that this won't have a service delivery function. That's just a few of the principles. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to Shanali. Tell us about the, the, the conversations that you're having with people your age, with uh, people um, you know, running businesses and with not the, the time or inclination to necessarily go deep into this this subject but nevertheless as Australian citizens they're going to be asked to vote um, just characterize what you're hearing about their concerns because we don't one doesn't want to ignore them it's important 
Well, to be completely honest, I don't know um, how many of the people I talk to on a daily basis know, and including myself, know about how the constitution works, know about how, you know, a referendum works. Um, and in many ways, this is the first time that, and I, you know, maybe this is just me, but I'd say the average Australian citizen is also learning a lot about how how Australia works in terms of its constitution and political system and its democracy in this moment. Um, but I think something that a lot of the communities that I work with do understand is meaningful representation. And to me, what I see or what I hear in the in the conversation around enshrining the voice in a constitution is meaningful representation. And um, for, I guess, you know, coming from Sri Lanka and knowing people who have come from places where representation, like, you know, you fight for representation or you've seen the way that people's voices and views and cultures haven't been represented. That is something that we recognise, that we see. Um, when I first moved here, before we moved to Australia, I had no idea that Aboriginal Australians existed. I had no idea that Australia was not a white country, you know? I didn't know that. Um, my impression of Australia was kangaroos and yeah, that was pretty much it, you know? Um, so, and then having been here, a, a, you know, a couple of years, more than a couple of years into being here, being welcomed to country by an elder for the first time and sort of connecting or getting a sense of the depth of culture and history and knowledge that that exists in this place and its place in the planet. I think that's another really key conversation that's happening with but young you're people. You, you have access, you work for um, a wonderful community arts network. You go out and you go to the Wheat Belt and you talk to people, as do I, as do I in my job now and then. And I, you get a sense of, of uh, you know, some of these stories, some of the, the history of, just out in the foyer, there's this, this amazing documentation about um, Aboriginal people in 1961 trying to, to get, cit a citizen, get citizenship in order that they could get an aged pension. I mean, you know a little bit of this from talking to people, but is that part of the problem that perhaps a lot of, a lot of us, a lot of Australians who'll be going into the booth to vote, perhaps don't have that privilege or that experience? <laughs> Um, I think perhaps what maybe going out into communities does is give you or give, gives me a sense of the emotional impact of our actions. When you go out to people and talk about, you know, what they care about, they care about their families, they care about their people and they care about the country, they care about land, they care about the place that they live in, right? And so to them that is, and, and you know, I, I, again, I don't think that's much different to the people in the room. Most of us do care about the circle in our immediate vicinity, right? But then it's, some of us have those concerns represented at a national level um, and other people in, in, in Australia don't, you know, so. And, and Ken, tell us about lobbying in Canberra. Tell us about the, 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 the fishing lobby or the, um, I mean, lobbying, advocating, having a voice, giving advice. This is pretty stock standard, isn't it, in Canberra? And there are quite a few people doing it, I gather. It is, and if you just take the pharmaceutical uh, guild now, you're hearing the ad. They're <laughs> having to dispense two months worth of medications, which make it convenient for people who have chronic conditions but they are working very strongly with their guild to say this is going to cost them money. This is going to impact on services that they offer. So they, they're lobbying through that process. But let me tell you, every bill that is ever contemplated is influenced by lobbyists. When it comes to the party room, you have a look at the list. It says stakeholders, key stakeholders for the bill. And you'll see all the organisations that have lobbied for a component or an element of that legislation. I did an analysis of 12 months worth of legislation from my party room papers. The only time Indigenous people were asked is if it was an Indigenous specific piece of legislation. Nothing else. And the lobby groups are extremely powerful. They also contribute to fundraising campaigns. 
and that does influence it's just human nature you look after your mates you look after friends and you do listen to the advice they give you the same-sex marriage uh, debate when that occurred what I liked about their campaign is they went and saw every member of the Australian Parliament Indigenous Australians when they go only tend to go to the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs the shadow minister and then one or two other ministers on a specific issue they do not go in large numbers and try and influence everybody to hear their view whereas lobbyists do that and in the future I'll be a lobbyist so I'll be doing the same I'll be going to every member in that place that I once worked Ken's just lobbying. announced his next job <laughs> <laughs> lobbying for the things that are important for the work that I do yeah. and you but, do have influence but Ken if we go back to the apology, the Ke Kevin Rudd's apology speech that we all remember from 2008, that got bipartisan support, didn't it? It did, although some colleagues walked out of the chamber during yeah, that speech, that, uh, that's which was true. a pity. Uh, but I, I think one of the points that was made recently by Tim Dixon, who actually helped write the apology speech, he said that there is a problem with this, uh, with the discussion about uh, the voice and with the campaigns. And he said, point to the concrete benefits of the voice because people are not being told that and they're not getting a sense of what the concrete benefits are. Th that was his criticism. Answer, answer that one, uh, uh, Jackie or Hannah or anyone. Happily give one example. You know, I work in the area of violence against Indigenous women, and this is a really shocking, very serious issue. An Aboriginal mother in our state is 17.5 times more likely to be a victim of murder than a non Aboriginal mother. That's horrific, and that's an old statistic. Nobody's watching this, nobody's doing much about it, but we've been advocating as Indigenous women for our own separate action plan to address violence against Indigenous women at the UN, we have to do this at the United Nations because we have no voice in Australia. If we had a voice here, we could have used that body to advocate why we need better policy planning uh, because there is so much work to be done. And I think that's being made clear regularly to all of us now, uh, you know, including with the coronial inquest underway in the Northern Territory where we see police officers mocking Aboriginal, an Aboriginal woman who's then murdered leaving her vulnerable like that. These are, the, these are the issues that we want to direct increased attention to and to you know, argue for Aboriginal women's equality, Aboriginal women on boards too. There's so many issues, but for women and gender equality and safety, I think the voice has to um, you know, play a really important role. And um, just in Carnarvon last week, uh, one of the issues is um, justice and kids and the way they're treated in this state. And um, I mean, it's all about the law, LAW, but if you compare that to, you know, our law, it would give us a say in terms of how we might do things differently. It's not about putting kids in a 10 foot, what do you call them, cell with a little window and giving them no other support or inspiration or development and expecting them to come out the other side good citizens. And if you watched um, the road trip on this, the yes referendum in Tasmania last week, you would have seen the mutton birding activity that happens on Port Barron Island or one of those islands there, where the community, instead of the kids going to the institutions, white institutions, they get sentenced to the community, which is quite isolated, um, with very little resources, but they're taught how to do mutton birding like they used to in the old days. And whilst they're doing that in the right way of dealing with mutton birds, they've also got elders in their ear and talking to them and um, just developing them subconsciously you know into a positive outlook on life and contributing to the community in a positive way and um, that's the alternative to prison then you've got in orange i think they had a similar program where kids were into fast cars and 
you know, all that sort of stuff that happens in Perth on a regular basis. But instead of sentencing those kids, they were assigned to some place there and they started panel beating cars and fixing up cars and doing all that. So there's all, and they're both Aboriginal run activities. But, but, in, a, but a, a criminal justice system or somebody in it was listening yes, and, and yes. acknowledging the ability of that community to be part of the solution. Be part of the solution, supported them to be part of the solution financially mm. and in terms of the justice system and going through the court process, the court process saw that as an alternative to sentencing to institution. Mm. Mm. So, you know, they're all practical things that can and should happen to keep kids out of prison, deal with the recommendation of the Royal Commission that incarceration is the last resort. Mm. I want to deal with the fear factor because I think, um, you know, it, it doesn't help to ignore people's fear, if you like, about, about this referendum. And I, I was interested in you raising, Ken, the business of native title because Ben Wyatt, who, as you all know, is the former WA Treasurer and Aboriginal Affairs Minister and Ken's relative, um, is, what is, what relative is he? I can never quite remember. If it's done our way, he's yeah. my nephew. Uh -huh. So Cedric's my cousin, Ben's his son. Right. What he says is that what's very clear is that issues concerning the relationship between First Nation people and the Australian nation can permanently be solved only with a broad political consensus. And he gives the example of native title and how opposition to it has waned as industry has come to see the benefits of dealing with legally empowered traditional owners. And he says, it's this experience with native title that should provide politicians of all stripes with confidence that the Uluru Statement from the Heart provides the nation's governments with an opportunity to resolve a range of other extraordinarily complex public policy issues. And we've mentioned some of them, incarceration, health, etc. Uh, he mentioned stolen wages. Can you talk to that a bit? I mean, what, what, is, he, is he right? Um, well, he is, when you consider WA. Uh, Colin Barnett and Christian Porter were very ambitious in having the South West Land and Sea Council enter into a series of negotiations for a Nyungar land agreement, which meant a combination of considerations about native title, but also freehold land and cultural land. And when they went through, there was no rumbling at all about a significant, and it is a treaty, even though it's called a land agreement. And the Yamaji one was the same. As they worked that through, People within that Yamaji region around Geraldton, including sections of the railway line, locals weren't perturbed by the fact of this land agreement that had a common uh, area that all of them had used at different times being acceptable as an opportunity that would give economic development to both Aboriginal uh, groups. So that's not caused a ripple anywhere. And it's, Ben is quite right about native title. Once people got over their fear, there's been incredible benefits derived all around the nation um, that has seen people into jobs, into economic uh, supply chains, uh, indigenous companies um, providing services to mining companies, and then we've seen employment uh, through so a number of them. Why is it then that in the 15 months since Anthony Albanese was elected on a promise of calling a referendum on The Voice, support for the proposal has gone down? That I don't know. I, it, it, part of it, look, part of it is the, the message that my former colleague gave about this being a threat to the democracy of Australia, a threat to the constitution. I listened to McKayla. And that is being said. It yes. is, and I heard McKayla Cash at the Ascot um, event making her commentary now, both those two are wrong. This is no threat to Australia's democracy, nor to Australians, nor to our way of living, nor to governments, because governments, by, and I was, I'm on the Indigenous Reference Working Group, along with Hannah, 
that third clause that said the parliament shall make uh, shall determine the uh, the shape of the legislation we agreed to that that reference group supported that particular line in order to take away the fear for Australians, but also to leave the Australian Parliament with its sovereignty. I think also um, the way they're going about it is quite offensive to the general public. They've gone for the lowest denominator, I think, in terms of people's intellect and their intelligence and ability to think things through and come to their own position on it. And to have a slogan that says you don't know what you don't know is absolutely ridiculous and the biggest offending statement I've ever heard in my life because none, if you don't know, vote no means um, is contrary to the uh, other side of it. You don't know what you don't know. Mm. And if you want to know something, what do people do these days? They <laughs> usually go on to um, the internet yeah. website, they ask someone, they do. What they're saying is just listen to us. If you don't know, vote no. You've got no intelligence at all. I mean, it's just so offensive. The case for voting no, I've got the referendum document uh, here, the yes and no cases. And it, one of the points raised is when previous changes to the Constitution have been proposed, there's been a constitutional convention to properly consider options and details. No such progress happened here. The process was rushed and heavy handed. Shanali, what? What do you make of that? Um, I'm still kind of mulling with your question of the fear piece, because that's definitely, you know, something that um, if you were to ask me what I hear or what I sense in terms of this conversation, the rising emotion is fear. Um, and I, I want for a moment to actually think about fear in a neutral way, so not as a negative thing or a positive thing, but what it does in our body and what it makes us aware to. Um, and I think for me, there is a sense of wanting to know in the fear and also the fear of what you might learn if you if you did go and find out. And I wonder, like, I, I do think that we are stuck in a moment of paralysis in terms of the history of this nation and where we are. And this, to me, is an opportunity to really step into action. And actually, that action is really terrifying. And as as you know, constituents of the nation, we we take responsibility for that action. And that's really scary, but I think that's okay to, to hold on to as well. Mm. Um, in terms of the convention, it's interesting because I, I don't, you know, I, had, I have no idea of how a, a referendum works and what a convention is. To me, it matters, it doesn't matter as much as understanding, you know, the people who are, what they're asking for and what, how, how, how I connect or what's my relationship to what's being asked. That's of interesting. Me. It's kind of like a generational t difference, yeah, isn't it? Maybe. Hannah, I mean, again, looking at this case for no, I mean, it says the referendum is not about simply recognising Indigenous Australians in the Constitution. That can be achieved without tying it to a risky unknown and permanent voice. Then it says recognition has the widespread support of Australians. This is the no case. Recognition has support. Um, however, this voice proposal is the problem. Answer, answer that to the person in the lift. <laughs> no, it's ridiculous. There, there really, there aren't any good no's here. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm being a fair balanced person when I say that, but someone who brings a life of um, learning around Indigenous issues. And, there, you know, it's to, to say that... Um, there's risks, we know there's not. To say there should have been constitutional conventions, but that's not what our leading constitutional law professors or high court judges say. These are things that are being conjured up. And, uh, you know, there does seem to be um, um, a difference with people's support, depending on age. We know the younger generation are more likely to support and 
um, women are also more likely. Uh, there's a lot of people who are a little bit undecided and won't know until the day. Um, I feel that we as a, a minority people, you know, we are only 4% of the state's population. And unfortunately, too often, although we have had non-Aboriginal people as a part of our lives, a part of our families, our daily work, etc., too many non-Indigenous people don't know us. And so these sort of racial prejudices that um, um, opposition leader and, and some of the colleagues are showing, uh, and uh, you know, this has been a very vicious debate, a very vicious campaign that has been on since fairly soon after the announcement. There's no, um, I don't see the decency, the fairness, the generosity or spirit here um, really, which has made this um, very muddy and uh, a lot of our people are reporting rising rates of racism, rising feelings of racism. And I feel it too, even now. Do you? Vicky, just mm. on that. Yeah. What I will share with you all. My first speech at the Crown, I talked about my charter letter. You're when you're a minister... Care? I didn't hear that. Your when you're a minister, you're given a charter letter. Charter letter. The charter letter that I received from Scott Morrison asked that I deliver a voice referendum. It asked that I deliver on truth-telling. It asked that I deliver on closing the gap. Now, that was right from the beginning. What year was that? Remind us. 2019. 2019. So in 2019, my Cabinet instructions were those plus some other things. And without disclosing Cabinet confidentiality, there were a number of papers I took to Cabinet on this issue. And there was no denouncing nor deriding of the papers I took. So I find it fascinating the very same people who are criticising now sat with me around that Cabinet table. So what's happened, Ken? Is it just that politics has it's become politics. divisive or...? It's the divisive Why? politics. It's individuals who are being divisive for the purpose of trying to regain ground that we lost in the last election as a coalition. Wow. Um, I'd like to open the uh, questions up to, to people. We do have a couple of um, microphones, I think. Um, do put your hand up and if I can see you, I'll... Uh, yes, there's one there and one there. Do we have the microphone? <laughs> it, this is being recorded, so um, it just uh, so I'd, it, great to have you you on the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, look, I just want to pick up on this issue of fear. I've just spent two weeks in Tennant Creek, and very very remote communities further afield, some of which are still dealing with uranium contaminated water. I did not meet one Aboriginal person who said they were going to vote yes. And the reason they gave, and I quote, is because they're going to take everything away from us. Now therein is a, a terrible form of fear and I would like to ask how, how you might respond to that. Whoever would like to answer. I'll, I'll start. I'll, some of that fear has been created by some individuals who've told Aboriginal communities, that if you support the voice, you will lose what you've got. And don't forget the Territory had the intervention imposed on them, and some of their decision-making structures at the eldership level were taken away. The NT, with the Commonwealth, created local governments for which Indigenous Australians have a uh, insignificant role in. And every time I went to a community in the Territory, uh, I was reminded who listens uh, by uh, elders, who listens to our voice? How does it get to you as a minister? How does it get to Natasha Files as the chief minister? I was uh, the other um, chief minister at the time. But they had been told that they would lose any opportunity they had if the voice came into play. Wow. Anyone else, Hannah, did you want to respond to? Oh, sorry. Can I just add something Please really do. quickly to that as well? 
I've, you know, also in my travels around the state heard similar things from Aboriginal communities and elders. Um, and to me, it's often a reflection of how little, how, how inaccessible our political system is. And what I, a question I've been sitting with is, would a voice to parliament actually mean that there is more understanding and inclusivity and accessibility of our political yeah. system? Or, you know, would it actually, so what would it do in terms of addressing the fact that most of our population, particularly a population that don't live in urban centres, do not understand how Australia's democracy works and, you know, is not is not in tune with the governance and the sovereignty and all of that stuff that we, we all kind of hold on to as our national identity. So in this moment in time, what we do, will it actually change that or will it, you know, what, what's our response to that problem? I just wanted to put that on the table um, as well. It's interesting. Professor Kim Rubenstein from the University of Canberra uh, had a, an interesting sort of take that this whole discussion is an affirmation of the value of the Constitution and that it is perhaps the first time people have actually thought, oh, yeah, right, we have a Constitution and that it's better than legislating because a parliament may choose not to follow the advice of the voice. There is no veto power. There is nothing to force a government. But Australians will know what the voice wanted and there'll be more accountability as a result. So that was just one kind of point of view. There's another question there. Um, as a supporter of the yes vote, I would um, ap appreciate some advice. How do I defend <clears throat> my position to the critics of the voice who say that it's going to be an empty echo chamber and that what it's doing is evading the more important issue of a treaty. Hannah? Um, it's, this, it's a very strange um, claim out there that this is empty symbolism. Um, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was fought for globally for a decade by Indigenous people and initially resisted by Australia, Canada, New Zealand, US, it expressly acknowledges the right of ind Indigenous people to our own representative bodies and institutions. And this is uh, what this will be. And I think for Aboriginal leaders and advocates, we do know the power of voice. We do know that there would be no native title if there was no Eddie Marbo and his team. And we have seen changes happen in Australia. We now have a separate national action plan on violence to Indigenous women because we fought so hard for it for so many years without a voice. We know how difficult it was. Um, so I think that's very, um, it's, it's not a right way of, of people thinking about this. It's a lack of understanding. And I also say, having worked at the treaty, um, under the treaty campaign with ATSIC and Jackie, that, um, we, I don't see how we could even negotiate a treaty at the national level if we did not have a national representative Indigenous body. So I think it is fundamental and that's why people decided at Uluru that voice comes first and treaty comes after. And is that your answer to the black sovereignty movement who do say, um, look, forget voice, we want treaty. That is what we're after. Is that your response? Yes. One and first, then the next. is negotiating a treaty and Northern Territory is progressing on the treaty path as well. Uh, so, um, you know, and we could in West Australia too. I think uh, this is like rejecting something that is so valuable that's absolutely necessary and there. And I know that people attach the sovereignty movement because I was sort of raised in it myself. Uh, but we have to, um, you know, come to terms, I think, as well with the issue of constitutional recognition. This is a 20 year process now. How much longer do we want it to go for? Uh, and here is um, a viable proposal that was put, put up by Aboriginal people after 16 regional dialogues across the country. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it is the, the counter to um, the sim symbolic recognition in the preamble. I'll come back to that in a minute. Was there another question? I think there was one. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I must say I've moved around most of WA in my lifetime, which is pretty long, and um, lived a lot with a lot with the community of Aboriginals, and um, and worked with them, 
and I live in a very large retirement village now. And the version I keep getting when we say, who's going to vote yes and no? And most of it is no. And then they say, when you say why, they say, we don't know what they're going to do and who's going to run it. One voice they're talking about, and I said, I don't think that's what they mean, but that's what the impression that's being given people. And all the others, are, are, they're not being... Um, it doesn't say anywhere about who is in going to be in charge of that group until it gets going, and it will need that. And it doesn't say who's then going to be the ones that keep tabs up on it, or, so or are they going to keep tabs on everyone else. There is nothing that says anything about any of that. And so that's what they bring up. They don't bring up, oh, we don't like the idea. It, that's not it's what they say. lack of detail. It's just that they don't know what it's about and yep. um, and when everyone talks about ones that have happened in the past and mm. fell apart, mm. that doesn't mean a thing to people these days because they weren't around probably. Sure. Jackie, how would you respond to the, um, the fellow um, residents of this, this lady's um, place? The, the, how would you respond to, to those people who are saying, we, we don't really understand, we don't know the detail? Well, um, I don't know what they're concerned about because Anthony Albanese will say the detail gets sorted out after, just like any other arrangement. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for how, do, how is this going to come about and be reasonable for what they want because they don't believe if it, a party or whatever gets going, they're not going to get any say in it. That's really what it is, because they don't understand what it is, and we can't tell them. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Ken's report with uh, Marcia Langton and Tom Kalma responds to all those sort of concerns, mm -hmm. and I don't know how you get the people in the uh, establishment that you're talking about to actually, if they want to be informed properly, to actually read that report and find out the answers to their concerns. That's what I was talking about, the slogan, you don't know, if you don't know, vote no. Mm. Take some responsibility, I say. You might still end up voting no, but who ever accepts someone calling me dumb that you don't know, so do this. And so I just go along with it. It just is not what I or anyone else does unless they willingly, unless they willingly want to vote no. And that's their way, their get out of jail card for being challenged or anything. If you're really a committed citizen of this country, if you really want a better country, and if you really want to deal with the uh, history of this country in a proper and honest way, you need to inform yourself. I cannot tell you how to vote. I want to influence you to vote yes. But at the end of the day, people must take responsibility because the day after, the day after, we all have to live with the consequences of that decision, whatever it is. And mm. I know I have dreaded thoughts about how I might be responding the day after. My community, everyone's going to have to deal with it in their own way. But, and that's after. But before that, everyone, every individual who has the capacity to vote and recognises the value of their vote should never accept as the bottom line, you don't know, vote no. I mean, that is just not right. Go ahead. Next one. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, look, my name's Bev Wally. I live in Kununurra, but I'm down here for other reasons. Hi, Ken. I, Jackie, we've met a few times at the AMS's, Ward Valley Health Service. You are doable. There is confusion. I'm retired from education. There is confusion around, because we've got a lot of um, Indigenous people that speak so many languages, and it's always been thrown and known that they only know yes and no, okay? 
In regards to the actual voting, when it happens, this is what some of the questions, the question that has been raised is as to why isn't there any detail information now? Why are we voting now? And, and you know, we're voting after. So this has been a bit of a drawback on the few people that have come to me about and asked me my opinion is to yep. and just say, look, why are we voting yes and yes and no now? Could we get There's a no crisp, clear answer about that one? Because the uh, Hannah or Ken or whoever, um, the, there is, I gather there's an answer to why you can't get the detail now, so I'll get someone else to articulate that. Well, well it's just the way that the, the, um, the law normally happens is that you have to have the power in the constitution before you legislate, and you don't do the legislation first without the power. So the, the power is the referendum question, um, this, and that's the way that it always goes. And we're doing it like that, really. So the government's doing it the normal way. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think, sorry, just to add to that, I, I, I do understand the confusion because I remember feeling confused about that and sort of reading into it and trying to find, trying to figure out what the difference was and why the detail wasn't there. And it was only in my research leading up to that, to this point that I realised that the constitution, what changing the constitution is just the principle the parliament, they make the laws and the parliament are accountable, the MPs are accountable to their constituents. So actually that's just how it works, but I don't think a lot of us know that or understand that or realise that. And I think that's probably where some of that confusion is coming from, but setting the, we can't make laws without setting the principle and what we're voting on is setting the principle. And I think that's, we're not voting on the lawmaking and that's not clear to people, I think. And just on that, Aboriginal media will now play a key role that the date has been announced. There are resources and materials that will go out across all Indigenous radio and television with in, simple in messages again. in language, yes. Uh, Darwin, for example, have uh, Donna Odegaard's uh, television radio networks. When we did the COVID work, everything went out in language in simple, clear, precise, words so that people understood what it meant. At the moment, there has not been sufficient detail in the way that people are asking. And it comes back to the Australian Parliament has to and can only pass laws if it meets the rigour of the Constitution. And if it doesn't, then it cannot proceed. So this is one avenue that is shoring that up. But the other now is the media campaign that will be quite intensive. Uh, last question at the top. Hello, thank you. Um, Ken, you just actually answered one of the things I wanted to ask about, because my question, when the lady mentioned that there are so many people in um, remote locations who are saying no, I was wondering what are we doing about that, but thank you for answering that now. The other thing I wanted to say is that in talking with some of my friends, and I'm a teacher, um, I was really shocked at how badly some people have been flipped because of the recent Duke and George legislation and walking back from that. But I was utterly shocked at the way people were talking about what they thought was going to happen because of that. And a lot of that was that fear issue again. So that, I, I don't know how that has factored into things over here in WA. But the main thing I wanted to ask is, I have been just starting my journey on trying to understand because I'm a yes voter, why people are so against it. And I've been really saddened by the weaponizing of indigenous voices that are on the no side, um, because people have the right to have a different opinion. But there was something that did confuse me, and I don't know how accurate it is. Some of the people with the black sovereignty movement and the wanting a treaty and the truth telling before this voice and the constitutional recognition said that they had attempted to have discussions with Mr. Albanese or whoever, but that they weren't, they didn't have that opportunity. Is that true or not? Is my first question. My second one is I know we can't go into the details now, but in order to address these concerns, what is the problem with outlining some of the key steps that could follow and maybe some sort of a timeline or are those things going to be left to the advisory body? Thank you. For I'll stop question. now. Yep. 
Uh, you see, I'll, I'll answer the part on the black sovereignty movement. They have met with, I don't know whether they've met with Prime Minister Albanese, but Lydia Thorpe is their main advocate within the Senate uh, and within the Australian Parliament. And I know that Lydia used, to, well, Lydia used to meet with me regularly when I was there. But she also meets with other key uh, influences within government. And some of the sovereignty group leaders have met with members of parliament. But, but by doing that, you are expressing a view which is the right and legitimate way, and nothing will change them from wanting sovereignty only. And that's their right. But there is also some people who recognise that sovereignty is one journey, treaty is another component, but there is also a need to have voices on committees, but they won't support the voice openly. Thank you. Yeah, and the other thing is, not all Aboriginal people will agree on everything at any one time. We're just not like that. I know we're a special group <laughs> in lots of ways, but I mean, it's never gonna happen. And in mainstream society itself, Everyone has factions and there's the extreme right and the extreme left and everything in between. And you've got to find the middle ground. And I think that's what's happened here with the voice and all the dialogues that happened around Australia and everyone having an opportunity to have their input into that process, that out of that came what was the consensus view of Aboriginal people, acknowledging, and you will get stories about the real left in Alice Springs when the statement was being drafted and whatever, and the real right. In the end, I think we came out with what the consensus view was, what we could actually get over the line. It's a, the lowest, lowest bar that you could ever ask for and that's what we went for. Um, all the other agendas, like mainstream politics, are always floating around the air and when people get the opportunity, they pull that balloon down and put it back on the table. Some things will never go away and never disappear from the debate, but we have to make some progress past the point of recognising us as people in 1967 and give to the point where we actually have some status in this country and we have a voice and a right to sit at the table and be masters of our own destinies. And more importantly, more importantly, I know it was said that I'm a grandmother of nine and um, the eldest is 14 and the, uh, no, the eldest is 26 and the youngest is 14. But I have no great-grandchildren at the moment. But I don't want my great-grandchildren sitting here in 50 years having this same discussion. We have to come to a point where we make investments today that make better societies for the ones that aren't here yet. And we talk about that when we talk about the environment. Let's look after the environment and nurture this and nurture that so that our kids inherit a better world. Well, a better world can't be a better world unless we are a better peoples right around the world. It, it, it's interesting you talked about the environment, um, Jackie, because today BirdLife Australia came out with um, an endorsement of uh, the yes vote um, and described the importance of the environment and the conservation of the things they love most, the furry things in the air, the f feathered things. Um, and I found that very interesting that there's a long description of why they are urging their membership, a membership of bird lovers, to, to vote. So that, that was an interesting connection to me. Look, just finally, and I don't want to end on a down note because, uh, but I do want to ask, if this does not pass, what then for the thing that we could have had, had it been a simple one-liner, do you re want recognition of Aboriginal people in the Constitution? Because that is what the opposition 
uh, voices are saying, you can have one, but we just don't like the other one. What's, th what's the answer to that? And how do we, just finally, how do we continue the conversations? As Naomi Moore and from Curry Mail said, after this event, how do we continue the conversations respectfully and what, how should we do it? You know, it was 20 yeah. years ago that we had the statutory 10-year reconciliation process, the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation final report recommendation that the constitution be amended to prohibit race discrimination. There was such opposition to that. And this was a proposal that came forth uh, with some substance in consultation with conservatives who were giving support and encouragement to it. So what next? We don't want to prohibit race discrimination. We don't want an Aboriginal representative body voice. We want symbolism. Aboriginal people will completely reject a symbolic acknowledgement of us in the constitution. That's just very, that is a low bar there. This is, this is great. This is high, uh, unique, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens on the day. Shinali. Um, I think I'm, I'm echoing what Hannah's just said, is that the first and the second are not separate, they're connected. The, the practice of having recognition in the constitution is a voice, that's what's being presented to us. This is how we practice a voice in, in action. A practice recognition in action is to have a voice uh, to parliament. So they're not two disconnected statements, they're actually connected and the same thing. Um, and the other thing I want to say is that the work continues and it has been, this is not, this is not new work, this has been happening for decades um, and the work in community continues, the work in education continues, the work in health continues. We continue to do that work in our own capacity, in our own roles and as citizens, the work as active citizens of this nation continues past this and I think that's actually a point of hope but yeah, I do think this is a real moment in our history. Ken. If this question is lost, it will not be brought back again. History shows that any constitutional question that is lost is never resurrected. And that will be an extreme challenge given we've already had a referendum that John Howard took forward and that was lost. You lose a second time when you've got a great opportunity then that dissipates. If you want to have an understanding of referendums, take the free book that the library has made available outside because that covers the story of a referendum that happened in 67. I think it'll have a profound impact, not only in Australia but globally. I was in USA and Canada for a month. I was being asked by people, how do you think Australians will vote? Will they support their First Nations people or will they reject them? That's in those two countries, let alone others. And I think that once we've had a loss, then the leadership is going to have to think about how it challenges to have voices heard through other mechanisms that are not constitutionally enshrined and hope that the goodwill of a prime minister and his government or her government take a positive approach to ensuring that voices are heard from the community level, not just the elites that are often sought by governments to give them the advice because the advice they get from a community or a region does not suit their agendas always. Can Jackie, I please, oh, yeah. final, final comment. Well, my goodness, I think about how I'm going to feel the next day if we get a no vote. My mother turned up, I experienced racism before I was even born. Heavy in labour, ready to have her baby at the Carnarvon Hospital. They said, you can't have the birth in the hospital. We'll put you on the veranda in the native ward. I was not allowed to have a crib to sleep in. A little hammock was put at the end of the bed and that was my first bed. So before I came into this world, I experienced racism and have experienced it over and over again. As a mother of three, I've had to continue that struggle so that my kids didn't have to experience a lot of the things that I've done, I had experienced. 
Then when my grandchildren came, I had to do the same thing. I've been doing it for 70 plus years now. If the day after we get the no vote, it says to me as an Aboriginal per person, your time on this earth has been zero. Your, as your value on this earth has been zero. There's been no advancement in your status in this country. You still might as well be on that veranda in the Carnarvon Hospital and be experiencing apartheid in this country. That's the sort of stories that we have to live with, that my kids know that story, that my grandchildren know that story. Do we want them to take that forward or do we want them to take the story of on the 14th of October, 2023, the lives of Aboriginal people changed forever in this country. We became real valued contributors to this country. We were able to start building our own capacity, our cultural capacity, our economic capacity, our um, political capacity, all the different silos of capacity building. We were able to take control of it ourselves and set the foundation for my great grandchildren that aren't here yet. But God forbid if I wake up the next morning and I say my 70 years on this earth haven't made a difference to my next gen generation of um, descendants. God help me how I will feel because I know it's only by, and the other side of the coin is, is that it's only by the grace of God and we're all very spiritual people, whether it's Aboriginal spirituality or non-Aboriginal. By the grace of God, he put Aboriginal people on this country 60,000 years ago. And same, by the grace of God, he brought everyone else that lives in this country by fair means or foul, or by welfare or by being rich, to this country too. And there's got to be a point, there's got to be a point where we say it's all by the grace of the spirit that we believe in, that we are all here in this same space. And we have to, we have to get to a point where we acknowledge equal value with each other equal value without losing any ground. I'm, I'm very emotional because I'm frightened to wake up the next day to a no, and I'm, it's the fear that I've really got. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much uh, for that, uh, Jackie, Ken, uh, Hannah. Um, and uh, Sh Shalini, um, if you felt this session was in any way useful and you'd like to hear more, on October the 4th, we'll be holding a second voice panel discussion right here with Indigenous community leaders and young leaders. And they'll talk about, um, in a sense, continuing this conversation that we just heard from the panel. They'll talk about their hopes on what the future will look like in the next chapter of our shared history. Outside, as you leave, you'll see a small display and video in the theatre foyer showcasing that historic 1967 referendum which Ken referenced. Thank you to our panellists, thank you to the State Library, and thank you especially to you as uh, our absolutely terrific audience, and thanks for your attendance tonight. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>